All right, that's the road that leads to my house. My house is just behind those trees, uh, about 600 yards away. But just wanted to show you, um, got a bit of a Chinook arch going on. So we got a bunch of nice weather coming out our way. And if I zoom in over there, you know, you can, you can see the mountains, a little bit of snow on the mountains. And uh, definitely, a little bit of snow around the neighborhood. So it's been a brutally cold November. Today is December 1st, so we're finally getting a break in the weather. And uh, I have nothing this week going on, so tomorrow I'm gonna head out to uh, Lake Minnewanka with Evan, and uh, we're just gonna go and knock this one off to make sure we had a hike done in December. Uh, we've hiked every month this year. Uh, in fact, we've hiked every month since August of last year. So uh, we just want to keep that streak going. And uh, before I head off, I'll just show you real quick how uh, some of the gear I pack for a trip right, like this. So I like hiking. I like winter hiking. I've been doing more winter hiking now that I'm not coaching. Did a lot of winter hiking last year. Did about uh, seven or eight trips. You can find them on my channel. Uh, I'm an engineer and I like to uh, blend some engineering and uh, hiking together. Okay, so this is my winter gear loadout. Uh, I do a lot of winter backpacking, but I want to make this, I, I thought rather than just show the gear, I thought first off I would update my risk assessment so back in the summer and there's a there's a card there's a link up top uh, earlier this summer i did a, a video that talked about doing a risk assessment for an activity like hiking and how that risk assessment uh, leads to your choice of equipment and how do you mitigate risks so this is a classic uh, and i'll put it up on the screen this is a classic risk uh, matrix with uh, the likelihood of an event occurring and the consequences of an event occurring and what you do is you populate the matrix with different hazards and you know everybody populates them differently based on their level of risk tolerance where they live the season that they're doing the activity in and then afterwards you focus on mitigating these risks that are in the red and orange quadrant so this was the uh, risk assessment for hiking that I did in the summer and what I thought I'd do is I'd update and here's my winter one so I'm gonna put it on the screen right now and and keep talking and what I want to focus on is show you the ones that are in bold so certain certain risks in summer disappear in winter and vice versa certain risks uh, uh, hazards appear in winter that you don't have to deal with so if you look at closely, what I did is I highlighted, uh, I made bold some of the changes between winter and summer. And I want to focus on the ones right now that are in the top right quadrant, the, uh, the ones in red, for instance. So the odds of the temperature dropping below zero or freezing in uh, summer are pretty low, but in the winter, they become a likely occurrence. They're almost guaranteed. And funny but you're also almost guaranteed to run out of water because the flowing water in this case turns into ice and you can't drink ice and you can't drink snow so that's those those are in the red but I wanted to showcase you know you can take your time pause the video and look at these things um, what's an example of a hazard that moved well being attacked by a bear is a likely occurrence in the summer and it has high consequences but in the winter I moved it to the not likely in fact it's almost impossible because bears are hibernating. You got things like bee stings, mosquito bites, you know, those animals are gone. Um, other, other things that reappeared on the winter hazard that aren't there in the summer, uh, falling through the ice, getting caught in an avalanche, uh, having to encounter two inches or more of snow. So take a look at that. And, and I can tell you right now that in the next part of this video, when I talk about my gear selection, in the back of my mind is this risk management for winter and you can see that in the winter I have to deal with risks that are different than those I encounter in the summer so specifically the odds of the temperature falling below zero are absolutely likely so that affects the gear selection that I choose uh, the odds of being caught in an avalanche affects where I will go hiking 
The odds of falling through the ice or slipping uh, on the ice or uh, encountering snow also affect where I will hike, the path I take and things like that. So just wanted to put that out there. I'm, I have a basis in my mind when I'm selecting gear for winter. It's different than summer, but it's because in winter we have different hazards and consequently different risks. So maybe not everybody thought about it that way. And then the other part of the video that I'm going to show you is that um, sure, you want to mitigate risks in the winter by selecting certain gear. In an ideal situation, you will buy winter specific gear such as a winter specific backpack or a winter specific tent or sleeping uh, arrangement. But I'll show you in the video that if you don't have two sets of totally separate gear, a lot of the gear you use in summer can be used in winter with a few adjustments. So we'll go from there. For, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm done with the 46 liter pack for the rest of this uh, for winter. It's too small. Winter gear tends to be bulkier is one thing. And then the second thing is um, trying to, you know, the 46 liter pack, everything needs to be packed perfectly in there and very meticulously. And when your hands are freezing cold, you don't want to be fussing around. So when I bring my larger pack, I can be a little more careless. I can just stuff the tent at the end in the sleeping bag and things like that. So, all right, big differences between winter and summer. Fundamentally, the first thing is it's going to be colder. So I need a better, or not a better sleeping bag. If you don't have a winter sleeping bag, you've seen what I do and I'm going to show you. I bring, a, I bring two sleeping bags rated for zero degrees Celsius and I put one inside the other and that gives me um, absolute comfort at night. When I come back from trips, I always hang up uh, my sleeping bags. So this is my trusted zero degree um, outdoor vitals and this is a zero degree uh, North Face. Both are down sleeping bags so when I put one inside the other you know a zero degree sleeping bag means that uh, it gives you about 15 degrees Celsius of warmth so it means that when it's zero degrees outside it'll feel like it's 15 degrees and if you put two zeros you get about 30 degrees of um, uh, of comfort of barrier which means that if it's minus 15 outside, it'll feel like it's 15 degrees Celsius. So I've used this setup, these two sleeping bags, all the way down to minus 30 and I've been fine. I wouldn't say comfortable in minus 30, but I've been fine. Got one stuffed in this bag. And in fact, the stuffed bags are, you know, it's a habit, but you, you can leave your stuffed bags behind and you can just, like I said, with, with the big pack, I can just throw everything uh, without stuffing it in sacks. In fact, it's more efficient. But for for this right now today, I'm gonna I'm gonna pack it. Okay, so I got my two sleeping bags. Now the sleeping bag is useless if you're well, it's not useless, but it's way better if you're off the ground with your sleeping bag and put yourself a layer of insulation between you and the ground. Now this is a Thermarest Neo Air insulated not the newest most modern you know with an r factor of six or something like that this is an r factor of three which is adequate it, it, it has about you know two inches of insulation and it's my summer mattress but uh for winter i can back it up simply by taking one of my you know we used to all sleep on these closed cell foam mattresses so i have a couple of them uh, sometimes I bring it in summer for teacup, but for winter, I'm going to bring it. I mean, this weighs like, you know, 100 grams, like six ounces. So, and it will give me the equivalent of about, um, you know, it'd be the equivalent of about an inch and a half of air mattress. So I get a hell of a lot of additional uh, insulation with that. And just, just for extra good measures, I'm going to bring one of these um, mylar blankets you know it's not quite a, a mylar safety blanket it's a little more robust than that you get these on Amazon for uh, for a couple of you know for ten thirteen dollars actually a cheap hack is to get one of the uh, windshield um, uh, reflectors like this you know people that have in the summer you can put it on your uh, windshield to keep your dash from getting too hot and they cost you 
you know, uh, you can get them for cheap in dollar stores. I got this one on Amazon. So, so if you look at, so basically my sleep system for winter is, is my summer bag and my Thermarest supplemented by a second bag and a closed cell uh, uh, foam pad and a Mylar blanket. All right, so I thought I'd show you actually uh, the setup in my kitchen of what I'm gonna set up in my tent. So here's here's uh, the Mylar, uh, well, I don't know if it's actual Mylar, but here's the the reflective blanket that I was talking about. So this, this is a little bit wider than my tent, but um, it, you know, it acts as a barrier. It provides quite a bit of, of insulation. So I put this inside my tent, not outside my tent. So this goes on the main floor of my tent. And then after that, um, I take my closed cell foam mat like this, and I lay that out on my tent floor as well, just like that. And then on top, I put my Thermarest. So I got a pretty good, um, I got pretty good insulation from the ground now. I mean, the, the mattress, uh, air alone is a good insulator. Um, but, and this mattress is about two inches. And actually a, a trick is, you know, when you inflate the mattress and you put it in your tent, it will get cold and it will lose pressure. So, so frequently before I go to bed, uh, you know, after I get in camp and I inflate my mattress, I'll wait half an hour and then half an hour later I'll go and reinflate it and then reinflate it one more time because as the air gets colder it loses pressure and the air from your lung is warmer. So uh, mylar blanket, closed cell, foam uh, and um, my therm rest and then on top of that then, then, I'm, then I use my sleeping bag and like I said you can so I'm taking summer equipment right now and stretching it to be used in winter and I've stretched this all the way down to minus 30 so it's not um, and most people will have a good zero degree sleeping bag this is my outdoor vitals zero degree sleeping bag and I'll put it in there and then I will take my north face also a zero degree sleeping bag And actually, by having a system like this, you have some flexibility. Some people say, why don't you just buy a, you know, minus 15 sleeping bag? Well, if I had a minus 15 sleeping bag um, and it's not that cold, then you, uh, you're actually hot. So this is a very flexible system. It, you know, it's a, it takes a little bit of getting used to. What I do is I, um, you know, you, you get in there, you zip this one up, and then you zip the second one up, and you're as snug as a bug in the rug. So there's, there's my... Uh, my summer system stretched to be used in the winter and I've you know you I'll put a link to the to uh, in the video uh, used this setup last year was three nights in a row of minus 30 now a rule of thumb that I have is I'm prepared for minus 30 but I don't go out purposely when the forecast calls for minus 30 because I think that's dangerous but if the forecast is minus 15 and I'm going out and somehow or other it dips at night and it does turn into be a minus 30, I'm prepared for it. My cook set doesn't change. So I'm still bringing the same cook set as I do in the summer. I always bring an ax or a saw. Everybody knows I like making fires. I bring a saw. But in the winter, I will bring an ax too um, for for various reasons uh, but I know that where we're going this weekend or tomorrow there will be some wood that will have been uh, bucked up and left behind by forest uh, rangers so in that case all I have to do is chop it up so in the shoulder season I don't need to change tents a good three season tent will work in the shoulder season but I will uh, say one thing so I'm bringing my ultralight for this weekend once it starts getting a lot colder, I will go away from my ultralight. I'll still bring a three season tent, but I'll bring a regular tent because the ultralights get to their weight reduction by having too much screens. And when you have too much screen material, there's too much air going in and out. So tomorrow I'm still just bringing my Marmot UL tent because it's only one night, but I, uh, instead of bringing my regular tent pegs, in this winter, I swap out to 
Now, if it was the real winter season, I'd be swapping out to snow anchors. But since it's not quite the winter season and I'll be able to put my tent pretty much on the ground, because in real deep winter, you don't get down to the ground. You're putting your tent up on snow, so you need snow anchors. But because I can still get my tent on the ground, but the ground is frozen, I'm bringing titanium pegs that won't bend when I hammer them in. Because the tent came with aluminum pegs, and these aluminum pegs will get absolutely demolished if I try to drive them into um, frozen ground. So for winter, I switch to my titanium pegs. All right, so a picture is worth a thousand words. I just wanted to show what I was trying to explain. So this is a three season tent. So January, you know, good for uh, spring, summer, fall but it's ultralight and the way it achieves most of its ultralight is by using lighter materials you know light uh thinner uh polyester instead of thicker polyester but the other way it really achieves a lot of its light weight is by using a lot of screen material so i'd say this tent uh which is the tungsten um ul the marmot tungsten i'd say about 80 percent of this tent is screen now even with a even with a fly over it there's just so much heat that can escape from this and my body in this in the winter will generate a little bit of heat so it'd be nice to kind of capture that heat and the other thing is there's wind that comes through now with the fly i will uh put the fly down to the ground and i can use my shovel to uh pile up snow to the bottom so that there's no draft coming in but i'm just pointing this out so this tent achieves its ul status by being super lightweight so i'd so in the summer in the winter Ideally, you bring a three season tent, but not a UL one. I'm only going for one night tomorrow, so I'm bringing my UL. Okay. And so in my hands right now is the Lunar Light uh, by North Face, quite a bit of an older tent. This is a true three season tent, uh, and it's a two man tent. Now in the deeper winter, I like this one for several reasons. I do like the extra space of a two person tent because in the winter, you have to do almost everything inside your tent, especially getting dressed. In the summer, you know, you can get up, you can go out, and you can get dressed outside But uh, if you just have a one-man tent. But in the winter, you want to do everything inside, so a two-man tent gives you that space. You know, trying to take off a bulky jacket or your snow pants or whatever, and you get all that extra storage inside the tent to put things. So a two-man tent is heavier but worth it in the winter. Okay. So. Now this, this is a true two season tent. So look at the difference. So um, it's not a, a UL model. There's some meshing on the side, but the top of it is all this uh, polyester um, and, and the tub is, is bigger. It's heavier, but it's, it's, more, it's more, um, more wind resistant. So there's a little bit less wind that's going to go in there and it's going to trap a little more heat. Marginal, but but it's also a lot stronger tent. So once I, and it's freestanding. Once I put it down on the ground, I'm going to put the uh, you know, I don't I'm not going to put the fly over it to show for you right now, but as it is like this, I can literally leave it on the ground and it's freestanding. And then look at these things too. So North Face knows that, you know, look at these big loops. I can put a ski in there or a branch or something. It's designed to um, conveniently be used in winter. It's a three season tent. It's a proper three season Just tent. Just wanted to show this is zero degree C, uh, 30F sleeping bag. And this is the same thing in an old fashioned wood synthetic. <laughs> we don't use these anymore. Now, um, couple other things. So you can see on the pack, there's a walking stick and I'm gonna throw um, a second one in there. Sorry, Ray. Uh, where's my second walking stick? I got a second walking stick. I wanna bring that. I'm gonna bring a second walking stick. And I'm gonna pack, so in, we know that in deep winter I bring snowshoes. I don't think there'll be enough snow for snowshoes tomorrow. I'm still gonna throw them in my truck. Because I'm packing now, snowshoes work well with hiking boots but i also work well with winter boots i'll talk about the boots uh after this i'll i'll decide tomorrow morning but i think i'm still going to bring my summer hiking boots but i am bringing nice warm booties uh these are uh made by 
uh, North Face, but the reason I like these is they have uh, a, a good proper grip. So once I'm in camp at the end of the day, I get out of my boots and I put on my booties and I walk around camp in my booties. They can walk around these in the snow. They keep your feet warm, especially if you wear two, three pairs of socks and you can wear them in the tent. So that's a bit, that's a for sure coming, but I'll decide, uh, I will bring the snowshoes, but I'm also going to bring, um, just micro spikes and these are micro spikes for running shoes. My actual micro spikes are upstairs. I'll show you the micro spikes, but I will bring micro spikes because I think the trail is going to be frozen. But micro spikes come in different varieties. You know, there's this kind of uh, this kind of micro spike. If you look at the side profile, these ones just slip over the boot. And if you want to get, if you're going to get really aggressive and you're walking across glaciers and things like that, I can get uh, almost. These are almost crampons. But for tomorrow, I'm definitely bringing the snowshoes and some micro spikes and I'll decide at the trailhead which one I'm bringing on the trail and then another thing that I also bring in winter is a shovel now this is a deep winter item uh, extremely essential but I'm not going to bring it tomorrow because I absolutely know there's not enough snow for that and I also have an ice axe if I was doing some glacier traversing and things like that but that's that's a that's for another video when we're doing deep deep winter tomorrow is more of a um tomorrow is a shoulder season hike all right then uh i want to talk about just a few last small items uh you know i talked mostly about uh gear like the sleeping bag and the tent and stuff like that but i want to talk about clothing so you know risk management uh in the winter I bring more clothing. So this is my clothes just for um, uh, a two night, uh, one night trip. So I bring a pair of fleece pants to sleep in and I bring a, an extra t-shirt. So in the summer I could get away with literally taking the pants I'm hiking in, taking them off and sleeping, you know, just in my underwear. Uh, same with my t-shirt, but in the winter, even a little bit of moisture will will make it uncomfortable you know will give you a chill when you're sleeping so i like to make sure i go to bed with a lot with perfectly dry clothing i i extra socks are so lightweight and so important and then and then the other thing i bring is uh thermal underwear so i'll have thermal underwear of course i'm not showing it here i bring a winter jacket and then i wear i wear an extra layer of you know i layer in the winter there's lots of videos on winter clothing so the key in winter is layering you know put a put a synthetic t-shirt on underneath put a fleece shirt over and then your winter jacket and then you can take things on and off as as you're hiking um gloves are important so i bring gloves for uh walking and for day-to-day -day activity a hat for my head I bring an extra pair of gloves in case these get wet, but these are also uh, lighter weight. I might sleep with these. And then, uh, you know, for, for Southern friends who are not used to this, call these a balaclava. So in the, in, in the middle of a storm, you can put on a balaclava if things get ugly and you can still wear your balaclava with a toque over your head. So a balaclava is useful. And actually some balaclavas, you can turn them into just a, a neck uh, warmer, we call it. So a balaclava is important. If I, if it was, re if it's a long expedition, and I'm going to do a lot of walking, I'm actually going to bring snow goggles, and then um, I bring winter boots instead of summer hiking boots. And then I want to talk about bottles. Um, a lot of people in the summer shift over to a smart water bottle, which is fine. And I could get away with a smart water bottle, but I bring a Nalgene. I pretty much use analgene year round, but the reason I like analgene in the winter in particular is because a lot of times you're melting snow and you need to pour it in from a pot into a wide neck. So having the wide neck when you're pouring snow from a pot is useful. The other thing is that uh, if it gets cold and this freezes, it's less likely to crack, whereas a cheap bottle will crack and things become brittle when it's especially cold. And you can even see on this one, there's a bulge on the side because I've left, you know, when uh, water will freeze very quickly in the winter in a pot, in a bottle, so I leave it next to the fire, which kind of keeps it warm. And lastly, you've seen that trick, I'm sure, on other videos. Just before going to bed, you fill this up with hot water, you seal it properly 
properly and then uh, you can throw that in the bottom of your sleeping bag just as you're going to bed and it gives you a little bit of uh, added comfort but uh, in lieu of that I also bring these hand warmers you know these are ferrous oxide when you break them open and they activate they start warming up you can um, you can use one for about eight hours and if you put it in your glove it warms up your hands you can put it in your socks you can put it at the bottom of your sleeping bag and more often than not I use it to keep my batteries warm so after all is said and done um, based on my risk assessment and my experience and what comes out of the risk assessment in terms of the gear I need to mitigate the risks I have three rules of thumb that I use in winter the first rule of thumb is everything is about uh, your pack weight your gear is about 50% heavier than usual um, you know the sleeping bags are, are bigger the tent is maybe heavier you have a little bit more clothing the boots are heavier you might bring more food have a little more calorie whatever it is so your weight is 30 to 50 percent more than usual and consequently you end up with needing a pack that's 30 to 50 percent bigger than in the summer the second thing is um, everything takes longer to do so whether it's setting up your tent because it's cold or having to collect or, or your chores around camp like getting water getting firewood cooking everything's slower uh, just because of the environment that you're in you're not as mobile you got bulkier clothing and there's different tasks and you're losing daylight so I have a second rule of thumb which is I limit my travel to no more my kilometers that I'm willing to travel match the number of hours in a, uh, in a day so in the winter when the sunrise is uh, not until 8 o'clock and sunset is at say 3 30 so that's uh, seven and a half hours I limit my hiking to seven kilometers doesn't mean I'm going to do it in one kilometer I can still do it you know I, I might still be able to travel those seven kilometers in two hours even though there's seven hours of daylight but my rule is I don't push farther in terms of a number than the number of hours so if there's eight hours of daylight I will not go farther than eight kilometers if there's nine hours of daylight I'll go nine kilometers but I lower my expectations and my objectives in terms of distance uh, I give myself a safety margin and that's the rule of thumb I use and the third rule I use is matching the first two is everything is slower in uh, everything takes about you know you walk slower you're slower to set up so um, you're slower to do chores so 50% more gear only hike as far as the number of hours in the, of daylight in the day and reduce your um, time to do anything by about 50% hope that makes sense so those are the guidelines I'm using based on my risk management based on my years of experience and that allows me to select my gear Evan and I took a look at the forecast and there's a break in the weather so today is Tuesday and we're at Lake Minnewanka we're just gonna go do a quick overnight the snowshoes are gonna stay again bring the big pack in the winter just for convenience Lake Minnewanka We're heading down there somewhere. Stewart Canyon. Where's the trail? We're there. Yeah, we're in the right spot. We're going to LM8. 7.6K, and if we don't like it, we'll go to LM9. Well, that was quick. Yeah. 
pillow, one sleeping bag, inside a second sleeping bag, thermarest, purple uh, yoga mat, and a mylar reflective blanket. So definitely not going to be cold tonight. It's not even feeling cold. I'm not going to be cold, but I'm going to be crooked. No big deal. Did we go by that outhouse on the way in? Yeah, we came directly at it and then we went towards the fire. This is actually a very large lake. I'd say it's about oh, 25, 30 kilometers long. The tent pads are quite a ways away from the cooking area. There's 10 here. Oh, totally. Well, the lake's got a weird shape. You go down and then head that way. The water levels are interesting when you look at the, the shelves. Assume that well, because it's controlled by a dam, the water yeah. can come up quite a bit. Midsummer, they probably have another four feet. And as it I, I was wondering why there's a sign on the beach, but now it makes sense because people come here by canoe, so you see it from the beach. That's why yeah. there's a sign. And then they'll hike to Hallemeyer Lookout up top. Too. Look at the roof. Sunroof. Holy smokes. A place to hang your towel. <laughs> you want me to be quiet? No, I'll keep talking. All trails, there's a report at. What's the lake? Right as you pass Castlegar, not Castlegar, right as you pass Castle, turn off 93 south, and you're headed to Lake Louise. It's. Um, You've been there with your boys. Taylor? Taylor Lake, yeah. Somebody had a report on Taylor Lake where they're like, you do all this climbing, but you just get colder as you go further up the mountain. <laughs> Aren't you getting closer to the sun? Shouldn't you be warmer? Yes, lady. Sure. <laughs> Oh my god, the presentation on this one is like epic. Oh wow. Yeah. 
halibut, I think is my favorite fish. Because it's a white fish, but it does have a taste, right? A, a nice uh -huh. flavor and texture. fish that don't that doesn't taste like fish <laughs> <laughs> I really like whatever soul because it doesn't taste it like fish it tastes like okay fish. well that's your choice that's fine <laughs> well if you like this video and you want to see me do more cool stuff out here make sure I don't talk with my mouth full um, Make sure to subscribe, give it a thumbs up. Check out Marty's video of the trip because it's pretty cool. It's an iconic trip in Banff. Quite easy, eight kilometers. It took us about two and a half hours this morning, even in the cold weather and slippery trail that we had to get here. Um, you kind of follow the lake, so it's quite easy. But uh, check it out. Fantastic afternoon we've had so far. We're gonna have a fire going, warm up. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks again for watching. Cheers, folks. They would, they would bike up for about 15 kilometers. In the last 22 kilometers, they would put their bike on their shoulders and just hike. Oh yeah. Like an 11. Whoever at Parks Canada ordered these, don't. Uh, sure, it looks pretty because it's got the logo and it's got the laser etching out there, but the firebox is too high, which forces you to make a fire that's too big for nothing. The grate isn't removable, and uh, there's no holes around the base for proper air, so you got to dig it out. So this is a big fail. And I don't know why you guys changed designs. You've had a design for a firebox that's been successful that's worked for 30 years and suddenly you guys are changing the design and coming up with something that barely works so um disappointed in fact i'm i'm, I'm just going to say this whole campsite here uh is a disappointment i don't know who laid this out but the tents pads are like half a mile away from the cooking area and the tables are far from the fire pits you, you just messed up this design i mean the view from the beach is pretty, but I'm not going to go as far as saying this is a, uh, a nice campsite. It absolutely isn't. Well, that was a quick trip in and out, seven kilometers. And uh, I didn't film a lot because basically the trail is high up on the shores of the lake uneventful not a lot of scenery or anything worth filming but you get the gist what 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 hey oh, blah, blah, blah.
field with the body. So we can give it a little more snow as we get to the lower elevation. Evan, yes. we hiked overnight Not every this. month this year, man. It's amazing. Every month since. All right, we were at the far end of the lake. We're actually crossing the dam. This is a dam that was built in 1941 to to provide a little bit of hydro for the city of Banff or the town of Banff, but more importantly, it's just to control the levels of the lake. 